the topic, as, as Jeff nicely said for me, um, is, is turbulence in the solar wind. Um, and just sort of vaguely setting the scene here, there's a picture of the, of the sun in the middle and you can see stuff streaming away. That is the solar wind and we'll have uh, an introduction to that. There's really three parts to the talk here. An introduction to the solar wind, an introduction to turbulence, um, and then plugging those two together um, and how it works in space. So I think uh, probably you've all seen things a bit like this before, a picture of the solar system, planets orbiting the sun. Uh, and the, the picture of the sun is a, is a real one, but it's a different scale than the planets. If the uh, Earth was to scale with the sun there, oh, sorry, um, then it would be like one of these little bright dots that you can just about see there. That's the actual size of the Earth. You could fit 100 Earths across the diameter of the sun. Um, so it's really a, a much, much bigger object in the, in the solar system. And as it looks out here, it looks like there's empty space between all these planets. But that's not really what it is. It's, it looks dark on the picture, but it's actually full of this stuff called plasma. Um, and you may remember or not from your um, own schooling and stuff, is that there are four states of matter. There's a solid, so if you take water and put it in the freezer, then you have a solid um, lump of water, ice. If you heat that up, it turns into liquid. Um, that you can drink, and if you keep heating it, it turns into the steam above the kettle when you're boiling that, that's a gas. So that's about 100 degrees. If you could keep heating that water up to about 10,000 degrees, then you'd start ripping the atoms to bits and ripping the electrons off the atoms. So that ionized gas where the electrons come loose, that's called a plasma, and all of the stuff on the sun is in that state. The electrons are being ripped loose like that. So that's what fills the space between the planets. Uh, we have these protons and electrons, positive and negatively charged things, and they make electric currents and magnetic fields um, and fill up that space there. Well, I'm saying that they fill up the space, um, kind of. They're there, and it's true that they, they occupy it all, but it's pretty thinly spread out, right? And each little cubic centimetre, so about the end of one of your fingers, there are 10 protons and 10 electrons, roughly, if you're near the Earth, right, this, this planet here. As you go further out, it gets thinner. For comparison, all this air in here that we're breathing, there are a billion, billion times more particles in each cubic centimetre, right, 10 to the power of 19. Right, so space is full, but not compared to what we have here on the Earth. Okay. So... The, the sun's atmosphere is all these protons and electrons separated and moving around, making electric currents, making magnetic fields, um, and it's really hot. It's about a million degrees. In fact, it's so hot that even though the sun is this massive object with a really strong gravitational field, it's not strong enough to hold on to that atmosphere, and the atmosphere streams outwards um, through, the, through the solar system. It does that fast. Right, if you look at, you've got to read this carefully, it says 300 to 1,000 kilometres per second, not per hour, per second. So roughly the gas that's above the poles here, this north pole of the sun, you can see these rays moving away and above the south as well, they're going at something like 800 kilometres a second. So Auckland to Wellington, one second. On the other hand, because it's so thin, right, there's only 10 or so particles in each cubic centimetre, if you could put a tree out here near the Earth, somehow, um, you've got this fast, thin wind, even though it's going at 800 kilometres a second, it wouldn't rustle the leaves on that tree because there's so little energy is actually associated with, so little momentum, um, that it wouldn't rustle the leaves. Okay, uh, and that wind just keeps going. It, it fills the whole solar system, or really we have another technical term for it, we call it the heliosphere, say some more about that soon um, and as another um, prefiguring of something to say that we're going to talk about space weather as well this stuff that looks like it's coming off the sun yes it is it could, can collide with the planets and we'll talk about that a little bit shortly right so I mentioned the solar system that that's what we're all um, well aware of I think and really that's about gravity it's about 
the sun being so big and heavy that it captures these objects and makes them go around in circles or slightly squished circles, the planets and the asteroids and those things. The heliosphere is really about the solar wind, which means it's about the gas that comes from the sun, the ionized gas, and the magnetic fields there. And so you get this bubble in space where all of the plasma comes from the sun. And that, that's sort of the more um, space physics interest is, is in that rather than in the planets going around the sun. That's a different branch of, of the science. Okay, so where does it stop? If this wind is heading out into space, um, what's gonna stop it? And the answer is really, until it runs into another wind, it keeps going. And this, ooh, ooh, this uh, other wind is from between all the other stars. There is an interstellar wind. Okay, and it's, if it's heading in in this direction here, then you to kind of smash the two winds together and they get to a sort of a pressure balance and you make this surface, this blue one here, is where they're kind of an equilibrium and balance. The pressure from the interstellar wind matches that from the solar wind um, and you get this separation surface where everything inside this is from the solar wind and everything outside it is from other stars, interstellar space. That happens a long way away, right? The, the usual unit that we use to measure things in space is the astronomical unit, AU, and that's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that's one unit. This boundary out here, the edge of the heliosphere, is about 120 of those units away. Okay. Um, now, some of you will have good eyesight and you'll be seeing that there's this other boundary in here, this dark blue sphere, and that's an important one as well. Um, what happens is the solar wind streams out in all these radial directions, and just like those rays are getting further apart, the mass is getting spread out thinner and thinner and thinner. The speed's kind of the same, right? It's, it's 700 kilometers a second here, it's 700 out here. But the mass in here is, the density is a lot higher than it is out here. Something has to give. You can't keep spreading this stuff out and expect it to, to um, obey conservation of mass. So what has to happen is it has to suddenly transition from a high speed uh, flow to a low speed flow, which has a lot more um, density associated with it. And that's called the termination shock. Um, and so as you go through that, that thin boundary on the sphere here, the edge of these yellow arrows, uh, you drop from say 600 kilometers a second down to 100 kilometers a second, but you make the gas thicker and everything starts behaving itself. In fact, you have all seen this, but you may not have realized it, right? So at home, in your kitchen sink, there is a model of the whole heliosphere there. So here's the sun, um, kind of extended, right? Where it hits the sink here, you get the sun, and there's this circular disk of uh, fast-flowing water. And it flows out radially, like the solar wind, until you get to this transition region here where it jumps up and you have this big fat layer of water that's moving a lot slower. That boundary is like the edge of the, the solar wind, that first edge, the, the, the shock wave where they go through there. Okay, so yeah, the sun hits there, you get this fast, shallow flow, and then it transitions to a, a fatter, slower flow out there. So you can all go home and observe this uh, in, your, in your sink tonight. Um, and you know, do your own little space physics experiment there. Okay, how do we know any of this, right? I mean, everyone likes to um, be reassured that theories and theorists haven't just run away with themselves and um, made stuff up. We need to verify this. And so there have been a whole lot of spacecrafts uh, put up into space from uh, NASA and the Japanese uh, Space Agency, the European Space Agency, a few others and they've made measurements of all sorts of things. Um, the electric field, the magnetic field, how fast it's going, these, this mass density of the plasma. And this is the sort of stuff that they report on here. So in here is the sun, North Pole, South Pole, and it rotates around about once a month. Um, and the graph on here is showing us uh, the speed of the solar wind um, at the various places above the sun. Okay, so sort of above the North Pole, you've got this more or less steady flow of about 800 kilometers a second. You can see it fluctuates a bit, plus or minus 50 maybe, and the same sort of behavior above the South Pole. Okay. 
But in the middle, near the solar equator, much bigger fluctuations, and it's harder to say what the average value is. Okay, and my interest is in these fluctuations here. Um, how that turbulence, how the waves and turbulence that, that characterise those fluctuations get generated, um, and how they change, how they evolve as they move outwards past, past all the planets. Just to come back to that uh, unsteadiness of the wind there, the fact that it's not just a nice smooth flow forever, um, like our own atmosphere where we don't have that uh, steady flow all the time either, we have storms, we have uh, fast winds and slow winds, we have hurricanes and tornadoes. There are analogues of all of those things happening in space and between the planets. Uh, and that's uh, called space weather, um, at least when we're trying to get funding for it. Um, <laughs> and what happens is, you know, every so often the sun will, will have one of these giant eruptions here. It'll spit off this huge chunk of mass, right? Remembering that the smallest bright dot you can see on there is about the size of the Earth. So this thing is huge. Uh, and sometimes those head towards the Earth, okay? Mostly they don't, but sometimes they do. And they can cause problems when they, when they get there. Luckily, the Earth, which is not to scale here, has its own magnetic field. It's like there's a giant bar magnet inside the Earth and it makes this, this pattern, sort of spider-shaped pattern of magnetic field lines here. And that makes a, a bit of a magnetic bubble around the Earth that stops the worst parts of the storm getting in and, and damaging life, mostly, uh, but also technology um, on, on our planet. And because some of these uh, coronal mass ejections can head towards the Earth, um, there's, there's uh, research projects and funding goes into determining when that's going to happen. What the, what the um, manufacturers of the satellites that orbit the Earth want to know is when should I turn my satellite off because it cost me $100 million to put it up there. Um, I don't want it to get electrically fried by this magnetic storm coming through and it be an expensive piece of scrap metal. Okay, so what they want to do, want to know, is when one of these eruptions happens, is it going to hurt the Earth first? If it is, when? So that we can say to them, switch the satellites off between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and you should be okay. Um, so that's the sort of the negative side of, of these uh, coronal mass ejections interacting with the Earth. Um, the positive side is, and you know, some of you may have seen these, is that you get aurora, northern lights, southern lights, um, shimmering curtains of greens and reds that you can see in the sky. Um, I haven't actually seen any of them myself, unfortunately, um, but, but maybe some of you have, and that's the gas, this plasma from the sun, filtering in just a little bit through the Earth's magnetic field into uh, our atmosphere and interacting there. Okay, uh, so that was part one. That's our brief introduction to the solar wind. Um, the next part is an introduction to turbulence. And I think, again, we all have uh, uh, an intuitive idea of what we mean when someone says turbulence. Um, maybe it's something like this, where we've got a river with this bubbling around, energetic, active behaviour going on. Nothing's very smooth. If we look here, you can maybe see some circulating water. Um, we call that a vortex. And if you looked closely enough, you'd be able to see smaller ones and bigger ones. There'd be a whole range of different sizes of these objects. The other thing that you can um, see when you're standing next to a river like this is shear layers. There are regions of the fluid where the top is going faster than the, the layer underneath or the other way around. It doesn't really matter. And that shear is a, a fundamental um, aspect of the turbulence um, and how these vortices get generated. We'll get to that shortly here. So, uh, here's a, a visualisation of some vortices in the Atlantic Ocean. Right? Um, North America, here's uh, Florida and Cuba, Mexico over here, and you can see um, actual really large vortices in the ocean here, and then some smaller ones, still smaller, and then these stretched out filaments or tubes of vorticity as well. Vorticity meaning really just rotating fluid. And it's that point about a whole lot of different sizes, right? Big ones, small ones, smaller, smaller. Um, and the, the colour scale, scale here was chosen. 
not by me, but uh, by someone who was obviously familiar with Van Gogh's Starry Night um, painting, um, where Van Gogh had used his artistic genius, vision, insight to, to paint the, the turbulence that was in the night sky then as well. So just a little bit more formally, um, what's the difference between turbulent flow and not turbulent flow? Laminar, we often call it. So if these are, think of these as being two pipes with water flowing down them. Um, if the speed isn't too much, then the, the water will flow nice and smoothly down here and you won't have any disruptions. And that's often what you want in an engineering situation because it means that the friction isn't playing a big role, um, that what you put in it the, at one end of the pipe comes out smoothly at the other without too much of a disruption. However, if you turn up the speed, then those straight lines start turning into these wavy ones and things can twist around. You can see there's some little curly bits, vortices drawn on here as well, um, of different sizes again. And uh, those vortices, uh, which are kind of cartoon here, but the key feature about those is that they break up, right? When you have a big vortex, after a little while, roughly about the time it takes the vortex to do one revolution, it'll break up into a couple of smaller ones. Those ones are going to rotate faster. So they break up in a shorter time into smaller ones again. Okay, and that process is called the turbulent cascade, and that's the heart of the physics of turbulence, this breakup of vortices uh, into, into smaller vortices, and then those ones break up again. So here's another cartoon of that uh, cascade process there. Um, big vortices breaking up to smaller, still smaller, smaller again, and all the way down to these tiny ones. When does it stop? Well, when the vortices get so small that that rotation is actually subject to friction, then all of the energy in that rotating little piece of fluid turns into heat, all right, and so you make the water a bit hotter. Um, so it stops when friction becomes important, is the idea there. That's a cartoon. Um, do we have any evidence that it actually happens? Here's some numerical simulation evidence, right? So we take the equations that describe fluids and turbulence in particular, we solve them using numerical methods, and you produce a visualization like this, which shows um, how swirly the water is at any particular place. Okay, and you can, so you can see these tubes here, they're rotating. Um, there are large ones, there are smaller ones, there are thinner ones. If our visualization was better, we would actually be able to look inside one of the large ones and see smaller ones inside them, they're nested. The vortices are inside each other. Um, you have this big hierarchy of, of different rotating structures there. Okay. Vortices, vortices, vortices. I keep saying that because they're the heart of the, of the turbulence. Um, where do they come from? So I just want to run through this um, process here. We're going to show you a, a couple of panels. Um, think of it as like a movie uh, with time running to the right here. Uh, it's named after a couple of uh, famous physicists from 100 odd years ago, Kelvin and Helmholtz. Um, the idea is that you start with two layers of water, one moving down here to the right, and then the layer on top of it moving a bit faster. Um, so that's the, the key thing, is that you have the shear at the interface between the two layers. All of the dark green is moving at one speed, all of the grey, blue, is moving faster. And then you perturb that interface, you give it a little wiggle, so some of it goes up, some of it goes down, and um, what's going to happen? Well, this bit that's gone up, it's now in a part of the fluid that wants to move faster. So it gets dragged to the right, okay, and you get this curling over sort of shape. The bit that went down, it's going to move a little bit slower, it gets a little bit left behind, and gets stuck in here. And as that keeps going, uh, you generate this vortex that you can see at the end here, this rolled up piece of fluid. And that really is the, the fundamental way that you generate vorticity if you didn't have any in the flow to start with. You need a shear layer like this here. Okay, you can see these things uh, when you go down to the Waikato River, um, or in the ocean, or in the clouds. And this is a picture um, I think in the clouds, this one, there's, there's some object sticking up through the clouds here, top of a mountain, and it's, 
as the flow is moving across in this direction, it's generating some vortices that don't stay stuck to the object, to the mountain. They peel off, so here's some earlier ones that have peeled off, and they're getting a bit fainter because they're interacting with each other um, and generating smaller vortices as they do that. Okay, so that one's kind of nice to look at, but I think this one's even nicer. Um, this is the, that curling up from the shear layer that you can see in the clouds sometimes. You don't see it often. Um, I've, you know, I'm always looking. I've seen it twice, once in New Zealand, once in the US. And what's happening here is that we've got still air in the lower layer of the atmosphere, and up here, the air's moving along. Okay, and you're getting that shear and that pulling of the, the slower air to, to roll up and create these vortices here. So there's another um, little piece of homework for you. You can start looking up at the clouds and see if you can see this repeated pattern of um, vortices being generated there. All right, that's all about um, regular fluids, water, air, things we're familiar with. Um, the wine or the beer that's in your glass, you can make that turbulent as well. But that's not what we have in space. Right? We have a plasma in space, and so it's a bit different. It's not just neutral atoms. It's got these positive and negative charged things, protons and electrons. So you might expect that to be a more complicated situation, and that's correct. Um, the electric currents and the magnetic fields that are associated with those charges moving around generate um, messier turbulence. And Here's a picture of some magnetic field lines and some electric current structures, which you know, are just up there to show you that it, that it is more complicated. All right, so that's the uh, second part of the talk, the introduction to turbulence. Now we're going to plug those together uh, and talk about turbulence in space, in the solar wind in particular, um, and see how that goes. So the idea is, uh, is to, to use theoretical physics and computer simulations to, to take the equations that we know describe these things and solve them. Um, hopefully with pencil and paper, we can do that sometimes, um, not as often as we'd like. Uh, and then in that case, when we can't solve them with pencil and paper, then we, we turn to the computer and we, we use numerical methods then. Uh, and the objective is to explain, as, as we were talking about at the start there, how that solar wind moves out past the planets, how the turbulence and the waves are generated, um, and compare that with our spacecraft data, because it's physics, we're trying to tie it back to what we know is actually happening. So this is a, a, a plot from one of our computer simulations. You run it for a few weeks and uh, produce some pictures like this that you then analyse. Um, and what this shows is the, the density of the plasma over a really big region of space. Okay, this is out here, the green is out here in the interstellar space. Um, this yellow globe, which you might guess is the sun, is in fact nearly a thousand times bigger than the sun. Um, and the blue is the region where the solar wind is. Okay, so if you, looking at the color scale, green is not very dense, so the plasma is pretty thin out here. Blue is even less dense, that's the solar wind, and those two are running into each other, okay? And where they do that, they get compressed, and so you go up to the red color there. So this green stuff is getting compressed as it runs into the solar wind, and we're getting this sort of wall in front of it um, where there's a high density region of gas that's going on. Okay, it's a pretty picture. Um, how do we know it's accurate that, our, that we're really solving equations that describe what's happening in that part of space. Well, the spacecraft that we've launched and sent out there, not me, I mean we in general, um, start here at the Earth and they go out on path something like this. Voyager 1 went along this sort of a direction and was taking measurements all the way. Okay, so it's measuring the, the density of the plasma, the electric field, the magnetic field, the speed, um, and a few other things too. So that path, we can make a cut through our simulation data and compare what we have in the computer results to what's actually measured in the spacecraft. And that's what we've got on this next slide. Um, we're showing two quantities here, comparing what we get from the simulation to the, to the actual spacecraft data. On the left is the energy and the turbulence. Um, 
the measurements are these red circles and the black is the, uh, our model, our computer results. And on the right is the temperature of the protons. Okay? Uh, again, the circles are the actual data and the, and the black curve is, is the um, numerical model. And all of this is as a function of distance from the sun. Right? Remembering that our unit is one is the Earth's uh, distance from the sun. Saturn's at about 10. Pluto's out around 40 or 50. Um, and our know, agreement's not awful, but it's not fabulous either. Um, we are pretty happy with that, although there's some stuff to explain out there and we're still working on that. Um, this one, it looks pretty bad in here, around 40 or 50. In fact, that's okay. We know why that is. It's, it's a feature of, of what happened with the measurements versus what the simulation does. They shouldn't agree there, and it's good that they don't. Um, <laughs> as every theorist says. Um, <laughs> How do we get those equations though? How do we produce those plots, right? We have to solve uh, the equations on the computer for a while. It's hard, right? In principle, we have got all these protons and electrons moving around out there. They all, every one of them obeys Newton's second law that force is mass times acceleration. But there are so many of those particles you can't possibly expect to be able to solve that for every one of them. So you have to make some approximations. Uh, and there's a whole sequence of these things, and, and that's part of the art of the modeling of what's going on. But um, the one I want to focus on here is, is that we divide the flow up into an average piece and a fluctuating piece, the turbulence. So here we've got some gray axes. This is the velocity at some point in the solar wind as a function of time, and it's bouncing around here. Uh, you can think of that as being, suppose we average over a day. We might get this blue line. Okay, that looks pretty simple. We should be able to, to simulate what's going on for a blue line like that. Write down an equation to describe that pretty well. Yes, we can. Uh, and then you get fluctuations relative to that average. Okay, and you can write down some equations that describe what they're doing. And you treat those a bit separately. They have to be still connected, but you treat them separately. Now, the actual average in the solar one isn't this nice flat line, right? It's more complicated than that, but that's the idea that you have the average and the fluctuations and you um, address them somewhat separately. Okay, so what do we want to know about? We want to know about these quantities I've already mentioned, things like the density of mass, how much mass is in each cubic centimetre, how fast it's going, the magnetic field strength, and we want to solve for the average quantities. What's it doing on average as it moves out to the solar wind? But to do that, you have to know a little bit about the fluctuations. Right, they are coupled. What they, the, the average quantities affect the fluctuating ones, but it works the other way too. The red arrow, the fluctuating ones, affect the average. So you can't really just solve this and ignore that. You can't really just solve this and ignore that. You've got to do them both together if you want to do it reasonably um, accurately. All right, so two slides of equations. Uh, this is the equations for the average quantities, or some of them. Um, and really what this says is, is that this tells you how the mass density changes as you move out through space. Um, some of you will recognize some calculus stuff in here, rates of change and derivatives, those sorts of things. Uh, and this tells you how the magnetic field changes. Look, there's some red stuff in here. Okay, that's the fluctuations affecting the large scale averages. And this one's about the velocity, or technically the momentum. Again, the large scales are being affected by these red pieces, the fluctuations. And that's a coupling to the small scales. We can write down what they look like too, but they involve some new quantities that don't appear in these equations, and we need more equations to, to understand and describe what's going on there. And that, that's a bit messier. Um, you know, that's, there's no test about this. Or, <laughs> the, it's, it's just to show you that you know, we, we are doing some serious mathematics behind all this and we want to um, use this and analyze this. In some cases, we can, we can simplify a little bit further here and make some analytic progress, meaning pencil and paper solutions, and those are really helpful. But most of the time, it is what you'd guess from looking at a mess like that, that you, you can only solve it using the computer. And that, you know, when you do, you get these plots that we looked at before there uh, for things like the density, um, for example. 
Okay, uh, so I'm nearly finished here, just a couple more slides. Um, what the stuff I'm working on most recently is really at each end of the solar wind, right? The Voyager spacecraft, which is showing their trajectories, are shown here in these red lines. Voyager 1 went kind of north of the sun and to south. They're in fact out here now in this interstellar space. Um, and they have been out there, um, well, one of them a couple of years, one of them a bit longer. And so they're actually measuring stuff that has nothing to do with the sun. Right? It's, it's pretty exciting for us um, space people. And um, so the measurements are a bit different out there. There's a bit more going on, a bit different. And so we want to explain that. And then you can't see it on the scale here, but right in close to the sun, just a few years ago, this new mission was launched, Parker Solar Probe, and that's gone so close to the sun that it's nearly, almost, where the solar wind starts. Okay, and that, that's really exciting for us. Um, and, you know, that's returning measurements, and we're all working on it and trying to figure out uh, if our theories match the data, which is always the benchmark. Um, and there's, there's lots to understand and to, uh, to improve on with our, um, our modelling of, of what's going on in those, those ends of the solar wind, the start and the end, if you like. Okay, uh, and then last thing. Um, for me, the research has definitely been a team effort. Um, it's, you know, being a professional sportsman is a, is a fantastic thing, and unfortunately I've never been close to being that. But... <laughs> Being an academic is a little bit like that. You're, you're paid to play with ideas and equations and models and things, and uh, it's fantastic and I love it. Um, and I've worked with a lot of different people in a lot of different countries, and it's, it's all been really um, a lot of fun and, and uh, challenging and enjoyable. Um, and so I'd like to thank all of those uh, people, my collaborators and their institutions, and in particular the, the University of Waikato, for uh, supporting me in, in this research um, and all the projects associated with that. So thanks for listening. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Annika Hinze, and I'm the head of the School for Computing and Mathematical Sciences. Thank you, Sean, for this very fascinating talk, and I definitely learned a lot. Um, um, well, Sean is one of um, a group of astrophysicists that we have in our school. And as you saw, he bridges um, fields of astronomy, physics, mathematics, with quite a bit of computation thrown into the mix as well. Sean researches fundamentals. He does science in the truest meaning of the word, building an understanding, models, and knowledge about the world. In many, in many ways, one of his colleagues said, space is the perfect laboratory to study turbulence and discover patterns that can then be exploited for similar situations on Earth. So in this sense, Sean's research has quite a practical applications. Sean is quite a typical Waikato researcher, really. Without much fuss, he's doing amazing research with an excellent international reputation. So rather like his favorite soccer team, he's definitely top of the league. So even NASA knows about Shane and his research. He has several times been invited on assessment panels for NASA research proposals. And from the German Research Society, DFG, he received a fellowship which is aptly named after the 16th century cosmographer and cartographer, Gerhard Mercator. So Sean's science is as rigorous as his soccer schedule. And indeed, I suspect that quite a few of you actually know him um, from his soccer team here in the Waikato. So if you have any questions, uh, we don't have time for those right here, but you can join him outside in the Opus Bar right after the lecture. So please join me in thanking Sean again for his talk. And I'd also like to thank all of you for 
joining us for this last talk of the season, as it were, so the last talk in this Hamilton Public Lecture Series for 2020. And in the meantime, I would like to wish you all Merry Christmas, keep safe, and we look forward to seeing you again here soon. Thank you.